Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense. Common knowledge. Or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do. But only 0.1% a real geniuses. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast. I have a really great guest today, Professor Brian J. Ford. He's a professor, an author, a scientist. He was a research scientist uh, who launched major science programs for the BBC. Uh, he has multiple books out there that have pioneered new approaches in bringing science to the public and making it understandable. He's been in the science world for, uh, I guess, 50, 60 years. Great intellect, a uh, great person to speak to. We're going to talk about a very interesting subject today. Ben Lewinhook, I guess the creator of first microscopes. Uh, some of his original microscopes have reappeared and are at auction. It looks like at Christie's. And Brian has a lot, an inside scoop on, I guess, the provenance of the microscopes. So welcome, Brian. Thank you for coming. It's very nice to be back and uh, good to be with you again. Yeah. Well, tell me, uh, how did the uh, Van Leeuwenhoek microscopes first come across your radar and what's the recent development with them? Oh, the, the first time they came across my radar was when I was in school. Uh, my teacher was a man called A.G. Lowndes, who was a, well, frankly, he was a rather uncouth character. But he was at the Marine Biological Research Station in Plymouth in England in the south. And he came to my school, the King's School Peterborough, which had been founded by Henry VIII, incidentally. And he came for a year. And he said to my father that he wanted to give me tuition on a Thursday evening in science. And uh, he was great. He was inspirational. He taught me more than any of the regular school classes I'd ever had. And bless his heart, one day he said to me, um, of course, the chap who started all the study of cells and microbiology was a Dutchman called Van Leeuwenhoek. And I'd never heard the name, of course. And I said, tell me about him. So he, he sat back in his chair and he said in his knowledgeable way, well, Leeuwenhoek was a, a draper and a town of... And he told me the whole story about the man. And uh, he said, uh, and he made little single lens microscopes. And I said, really? He said, yes. I said, well, the microscopes we have in school are all big and have lots of lenses. He said, no, no, Leeuwenhoek, he, he just had them with just one lens. And uh, it was a tiny lens, but gave tremendous magnification. You could see bacteria. And I said, gosh, where are the microscopes now? And he said, well, there aren't very many, just half a dozen or so known. And I said, oh, all the rest have got lost. And he said, yep. Yes, the Royal Society had some, and they lost theirs, and all the others have disappeared. And I said, well, that's a shame. And he said, looked at me, leant forward, and he said very intently, when you're a grown scientist, you should go and find some. And I chuckled and I thought no more about it. But that's when I first came across Leeuwenhoek and the idea of one day coming across his famous microscopes. It was very prescient of the professor to say it to you. It's very interesting. Uh, if you fast forward to when you first encountered one of the microscopes, uh, what's the story behind that? Well, I uh, went to see the microscopes back in the 1980s, 40 years ago. I went to see the microscopes that they had in, um, in Belgium, in Germany, and in the Netherlands. Although I didn't expect ever to find microscopes, it's not the kind of thing that you can sort of, you know, aim to go and find, is it really? You can't really adopt that as a, as a serious an ambition. But always being interested in Leeuwenhoek, I went to the Royal Society in 1981, where I'd often been before. I've known all the presidents of the Royal Society since the 1960s. And the president then was Sir Andrew Huxley of the famous Huxley family. And uh, we spoke on several occasions about my work. And one day it was suggested that I should go and have a look at the letters of Leeuwenhoek that still existed, safely filed, in the archives of the Royal Society. So I was taken down to their big strong room down in the basement by Norman Robinson, their librarian. And he brought out these enormous bound books with Leeuwenhoek's original letters. And I said, hasn't anybody else studied these? And he said, well, the Dutch have. They're translating them, but they just had photographic copies of the letters. They've not actually looked at the original letters themselves. So uh, have a look. And I said before, you never know, you might find something 
microscopical lurking amongst the letters, you know, pollen grains or a hair from his wig or something. Anyway, I picked up the second letter dated from June 1674 and the last page as I was turning it was heavy. And on the back was a little white envelope about the size of a small postcard. No writing on it. So therefore it would have been of no interest to anybody making photographic copies, would it? So I opened the flap of this envelope and inside there were four little packets of specimens. I couldn't believe my eyes. One of them said, for example, sections of cork. Another one said, sections of pith from an elder tree. Another one said, white from the inside of a quill pen feather. I mean, I couldn't believe it. And as I held my breath and cautiously opened these little tiny packets, there were sections that Leven had prepared in 1674. He had sent them to London and They've been there in store, attached to the envelope at the back of this letter ever since. And I was the first person to have the chance to investigate them. That's really cool. So, That's amazing. Well, Andrew Huxley was very keen I should look at them. And the Royal Society said, it's very important that we get as much information from these as we can. So I said, well, I propose to take small samples of them back to the university in Cardiff and also go over to the Netherlands and see what we can find out about them. So I took small samples from these packets. And I took them down to Cardiff and the first thing I did was to look at them under the scanning electron microscope. And the way in which those sections had been cut, you know modern scientists study tissue sections don't they? And those sections were cut just as well as sections would be cut today. They were incredibly thin, they were absolutely exquisite. What do you think he used to prepare them? Is there any idea? Yes, he used a shaving razor. And of course, if you use a shaving razor, what are you going to have? Traces off on your razor. Blood cells. When you shave, you always slightly cut yourself, don't you? And on his sections, I found occasional examples of Leeuwenhoek's original blood cells left there since 1674. I then took small samples and flew over to the Netherlands because... At the University of Utrecht, they've got the most powerful microscope that is ascribed to Leeuwenhoek. Magnifies almost 300 times. And I thought, what can we actually see through this microscope? So, in 1981, for the first time ever, someone other than Leeuwenhoek could look through a lens of his microscope at a section he had cut and I was looking at the same view that he had had 300 years earlier. And I then designed a small bracket that could hold my Olympus camera with the little microscope in front of it and focus it on slides. And I took the very first ever colour photographs of Leeuwenhoek's specimens through Leeuwenhoek's lens. And that was utterly breathtaking. And then when I'd done that, I uh, made a, a finger prick of my own blood. The way you do that is to take a little microscope slide and break it with your fingers. Then you pick up one of the sharpest little fragments and stab the back of your finger. It doesn't hurt. And out comes a big blob of blood. And I made a blood smear and I put it under the microscope and I could see my blood cells through his lens and I could even see inside the white cells, details of the nucleus. And the view was utterly breathtaking. The picture has been reproduced and stolen by people right left and centre and put on their websites. Um, it's a very famous picture now, but to actually be the first person ever to look at his specimens through his microscope was the most extraordinary time of my entire life. What were the first uh, images? Were they, I guess they were hand-drawn by Leeuwenhoek? Or... Well, that's interesting you should say, because he wasn't a very good drawer. He, he could sort of sketch, but he said on a number of occasions that he, he, instead of drawing the specimens, he would put pond water with some microbes in a little tiny tube in front of one of his little microscopes, and he would then give it to a limna, a kind of, um, you know, the artistic equivalent of a shorthand typist, a limna who would look through and do the drawings. And so they were mostly done by professional artists. 
And uh, he said in his letters on more than one occasion that these people would say, wow, look at that. And he would say to them, you know, I'm not paying you to sit and call, but I'm paying you to, 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 to do the drawing, get on with the work. So most of the drawings that we have, which people often say are Leeuwenhoek's drawings of sections of wood and sperm and blood cells and things like that, most of them aren't his drawings. They're drawings of his specimens, but usually done by professional artists that he engaged to come and do the drawings for him. That's amazing. Well, wow. from what you saw in the images that you had created, how similar were they to the initial drawings? Very good. Very, very good. In fact, the most vivid thing about his uh, specimens was the way he described them, because his actual descriptions of the microbes that he observed, the, the descriptions are so good, so clear, that you can actually identify the microbes he was looking at from his descriptions of them. And I have recently taken some of his original drawings and compared those with the engravings that were then published. And then I've superimposed those onto videos of the actual living organisms he was looking at. And it's quite amazing how good those drawings were. He did know his stuff. And remember, nobody had ever looked at any of these things before. Everything he was looking at was totally new to humanity. It was totally new to science. And yet he was able faithfully to describe the organisms he was looking at. And we can see those drawings today and read his descriptions and just marvel at the incredible ingenuity of that man. Hey, was well, there anything new that was noticed now in the modern, you know, in the modern photographs? Yes, quite a lot. Uh, for example, the white cell I mentioned, the, the nucleus of the white cell in your blood is divided up into lobes, a little bit like beads on the necklace. There may be two, three, four, five lobes. They look like, you know, little beads joined one to the uh, one against the other. And when you look through a modern microscope, you can see it quite plain, plainly, but you can see that also in his. Uh, but I think the most exciting thing for me, or one of the best parts, was that he had sent some dried samples of pond life to London in 1686. He'd been sent by a correspondent in Kurland, which is uh, on the Baltic coast. He'd been sent what looked like blackened bits of paper. And this was called heavenly paper. It was believed that the angels up above would write letters and drop them down to people on the surface of the earth. And in some anticipation of the heat of re-entry, the paper would become charred and it would float down. But this was actually letters from heaven. And Leibniz didn't believe it. He thought, I think this is dried, as we'd now say, algae from a pond. So what he did, he took samples of the heavenly paper that he'd been sent from Cornet, and he moistened it, looked at it under the microscope, and he said, within minutes, my microscope had shown me it wasn't paper, it was a bit of algae from the pond, using our modern terms. So he then went to uh, ponds, and also to an earthenware jar that he had in his house, where there were little clumps of algae growing, and he pulled the algae out and dried them on blotting paper in front of a stove, and he created himself his own experimental versions of heavenly paper. Mm. So he'd used the microscope to show that the original sample of heavenly paper wasn't paper. And then he went to ponds and to this water in a jar. He took out bits of algae from that, dried it in front of the stove to make his own heavenly paper. So he carried out an experiment to prove that his observation was correct. Now, that's the kind of way of thinking that a top scientist of today would do his work. And he was doing that in the 1680s. That's pretty neat, isn't it? How was he received by other scientists? Was he laughed at or, you know, when did he show his, his slides and his images to, um, or the drawings to other people? He always said he, he didn't give a hoot for what people thought. He said, I'm not interested in impressing people. In fact, when people came to call to his house, you know, dukes and, and princes would come to see him. And if he didn't feel like it, he'd tell them to go away. He said, no, I'm busy this afternoon. He'd say to his daughter, Maria, who looked after him, tell them I'm, I'm not interested. They can just go away. He, he wasn't a social climber in any way at all. Although he did, he, he, his family name was Leeuwenhoek. But he decided to call himself Van Leeuwenhoek, you know, like Von in German, as a slightly uh, 
upper class name. He gave himself the Van Leeuwenhoek name in 1686 when he thought he was sufficiently important to warrant it. But he was visited by many people. He was visited um, by kings and by queens and he was visited by uh, Peter the Great of Russia. Uh, and Peter the Great came to Delft so that his Peter, people could learn how you do boat building. And he knew of Leeuwenhoek and his work and he said, can I come and visit you? And then he sent a message to say, actually, there may be so many crowds in the street if they see me, you better come and visit me. But um, everybody knew of him. He was very famous. He was almost slightly rock star-ish in his time. He was very well thought of. When his observations first came to London, they did tend to doubt him, the members of the Royal Society that he wrote to. So, of course, they repeated his experiments and lo and behold, there were the microbes he was looking at. So, no, he was never ridiculed in his life. A lot of scientists were, but he was always accepted. And he lived in his house in Delft quite independently. He never lectured. He never wanted to visit a university. He never had any students. He was entirely independent. And he kept saying, I know the truth. I'm making discoveries and I'm getting drawings and descriptions of them done. And that is my life's work. And I'm not remotely interested in whether anybody else thinks I'm right or wrong. I'm just recording the truth. And if they don't like it, they can lump it. He was very single minded devoted microscopist, and the most incredible man. So what were Van Leeuwenhoek's observations, if you remember any of them? Was he shocked by what he saw? What, what was his thoughts on what he was seeing? Oh, that's, I suppose, in a way, the most um, honest aspect of him. Every time he saw anything, he recorded his feelings. His writing was always very personal. He would write... A, and describe his state of health or the weather or what he'd had for his meal. He was, his letters were not scholarly, they were more vernacular. Um, but perhaps the best answer to your question is when he first looked at microbes. Now, what happened was that he was going across a lake called Berkelsey Mere in the Netherlands in a boat, and he saw these little clumps of algae floating in the water. And he said to the the locals, you know, what's that? And they said, oh, it's honeydew. Comes, uh, comes from the heavens above. And he thought, I don't believe that. So he took some back to his home and had to look at it under the microscope. And for the first time in human history, he saw pond microbes. And he wrote and said, I could see these incredible little creatures darting hither and thither, some of them twisting and turning and swimming upwards and downwards. And it was the most amazing sight I could possibly imagine. And I just sat there for hours looking at it in astonishment. That was the way in which he recorded his words, his thoughts. He really was open to telling people how amazed he was at what he could see. When he discovered sperm, for example, and, and he, he didn't um, obtain sperm through masturbation or anything like that, he said, he said the sperm was uh, after one's um, marital relationships in the normal way. But he looked at sperm under the microscope and did perfect little studies of sperm, the engravings that have been published. He must have set them up with the microscope wonderfully, wonderfully well. But of course, the question is, where did he get his microscopes from? And that's an interesting uh, problem, which I solved some decades ago. Yeah, well, yeah, actually, how did he know? How did he know that he would see things? So, right, what was the inception of this idea? The microscopes, I guess, must have come first? Uh, well, about 1666, he came to London on a trading expedition. And at that time, the, the book everybody was talking about was a book by one of the first scientists ever, Robert Hooke, who was the secretary to the newly formed Royal Society in London. And Robert Hooke had written this magnificent book called Micrographia, or, you know, what life is like through the microscope. And he had things like, for example, drawings of fleas and a louse in pull-out plates that are a couple of feet long. And he had lurid drawings of a nettle with all these spines showing underneath the leaf and the compound eyes of flies and things like that. And Leeuwenhoek because he clearly was a man interested in that kind of thing, 
would certainly have been shown that book when he came to London. Because, and this is where it gets really interesting, Robert Hooke actually described the design of microscope that Leeuwenhoek was eventually to make. But Robert Hooke had one of the microscopes you'd recognise, an old-fashioned 17th century microscope with a, a big thick tube covered with embossed leather and a lens at the top and the bottom, magnificent looking golden thing. But he wrote that the way to see really fine details, wrote Hooke, is to make a tiny single lens and he described exactly how you make it, how you draw out a bead of glass and then you grind off the little stem of the bead of glass and polish it until it was a lens and then wrote Hooke you would mount this lens in a plate of metal and perforate a little hole in it and mount the lens in the hole and then he said any object brought up close to this lens will be seen far clearer and at far higher magnification than any of the great compound microscopes that we use. Now that little bit, nobody had ever seen it, nobody had ever noticed that until I did. And it was hidden away in the preface to Micrographia where the pages weren't numbered. So of course, unless you can say what page number something on, it's not of interest to scholars. So that is the exact description of the kind of microscope that Leeuwenhoek made. Not only that, but that's where he got his ideas for the specimens. Because when you read the chapter that Robert Hooke had put his description in, he said that he had noticed the cellular nature of cork. And he said, I found the same structure in cork and also in elder pith. And that's the same specimens exactly which Leeuwenhoek first sent to London. So it's quite obvious, isn't it? That it can't be a coincidence that he must have seen Micrographia. He didn't speak English, but of course his host friends would have been bilingual and they'd have read it to him. Because the exact description of how you make a microscope and the exact specimens that he then went on to investigate were already printed in Robert Hooke's book. So that's where the Dutch man got his inspiration from Robert Hooke working in London. That's quite an interesting revelation. You know, had anyone made, like Robert Hooke described them, but did he make microscopes or was Leeuwen Hooke the first one to actually take the ideas and make it into a microscope? No, uh, Robert Hooke had made little microscopes, but the ones he made were the, these little tiny single lens microscopes. I mean, the, the plates of metal of a Leeuwen uh, microscope, I mean, they're smaller than a postage stamp. I mean, these little tiny rectangles of metal with a hole in containing a lens. The first compound microscope with an eyepiece and an objective lens, that was in the late 1500s in the Netherlands. And Robert Hooke's microscopes were made for him in London by an instrument maker called Christopher Koch. And Christopher Koch made instruments for many people. And of course, the instrument that he wanted on his desk was this grandiose leather covered gold embossed instrument that looked really exciting and impressive. You know, it was a kind of a status symbol, really, more than anything else. But um, I, again, was the first to point out, and nobody realised this, it's so elementary, really, that if you look at Robert Hooke's engravings of the flea or the louse, they're incredible pictures, wonderfully detailed. And you can see every hair and every pore and every little tiny vignette of the structure. Well, if you look through a Robert Hooke microscope, the kind that Christopher Hooke made, you can't see those details. They're just not visible. I've taken pictures through microscopes of that vintage and the images are just too blurry to see those fine hairs. The only way you can see them is with a little tiny lens held up really close. So in fact, we know that Robert Hooke must have made these single lens microscopes in order to fill in the tiny details of his drawings or he could never have published them. Isn't that amazing? When he Leven Hooke he died, he left 247 microscopes behind him. And he was wow. written about by a couple of Dutchmen. But it was really in 1932 that this great British microbiologist called Clifford Dobell decided to uh, write about Leeuwenhoek. He, he read up about him and he wrote this great big book, huge book, a beautiful, loving book. It's a masterful work. And in it, he described everything about Leeuwenhoek. 
and uh, described how he made his microscopes and all that kind of stuff. It's a really superb book. A a anybody with an idle moment who can get hold of a copy of Clifford Dobell's book. It was called Antonio van Leeuwenhoek and his Little Animals, published in 32, but it's been in paperback since. It's a wonderful, wonderful description of this man's work. He spent so much time preparing his specimen and people have often thought that in those days the way they prepared specimens was really very crude. Since Robert Hooke's work with cork, botanists had been eagerly tearing up plants to study their anatomy. And what they... But as I mentioned, with the sections he cut, they were extremely fine. And when he set up something like, say, a mosquito, held on the little point of a pin with a little spot of wax so he could study it, or the head of a fly, so he could see the compound eyes and show it to other people. Once he'd done that, he didn't want to dislodge it. He would sort of set the microscope aside with its specimen on, and for the next specimen he'd make another microscope. So when he died, he left 247 completed microscopes, and he tended to leave a given specimen on the microscope he'd made for it so that he could show other people or come back and study it later. When Dobell wrote his book, he described the microscopes and, um, and he also didn't give any hint that any more would ever be found. It was always assumed that the microscopes had all been listed and all been found. But it, what he didn't know is that there were some of his microscopes still in existence and the story behind many of them is really quite odd. The first one I came across was in 2009 uh, when I had a phone call from Christie's to say they had a Leeuwenhoek microscope going on sale. This was really quite astonishing. So I went and had a look at it and this actually was a microscope made of silver and it had been owned by a famous Victorian zoologist called Robert Maitland and in 1978, he had died, and his bits and bobs were still in Leiden, in the Netherlands. And a very clever chap noticed it was there, a chap called Willemsay, J.J. Willemsay. And he realised that in this little box of oddments was a Leibniz microscope. So he said to the boss, and he's going to retire, um, what about box of oddments, are they any good to anybody? And the boss said, no, not really, why did you want them? And so Maitland said, well, yes, if I could buy them, it'd be great. And so the boss said, well, how about 10 guilders? And he said, yeah, okay. So Willems, they paid 10 guilders, about five bucks. And he became the owner of this little box of oddments. And then a little later, he said, in all of these strange little bits, I have found a Leeuwenhoek microscope. And in 2009, he decided he would uh, sell it. So he took it to Christie's. I was at the sale. In fact, in those days, cell phones were pretty primitive, so it's only a VGA resolution film. But I videoed the sale. It's, it's the only record of the sale that exists. And uh, it went under the hammer. Lot number 88, going for a sale on the screen. The highly important stuff. Silver microscope by Lane Hook, circa 1690. And we'll start this off at 45,000, 48,000, 50,000 pounds now. 50,000 pounds here. And the person who bought it paid for this little tiny silver object about the size of a postage stamp half a million dollars. And the microscope was bought by a man called Rick Watson who was a book dealer who was acting as an agent. So I said to him afterwards, um, who actually has bought this? And he said, well, I can't tell you, but it is a European biosciences firm and they have bought the microscope. They're going to put it on public display or give it to a, um, a museum or something. Um, so don't worry, it's in safe hands. And I said, all right. So I would email him from time to time and each time he came back and said, well, I've spoken to them, but they still don't want me to say who's bought it. And since that day, it has disappeared.
Richard. It is just lost mm. to scholarship. Um, Rick Watson is forbidden from telling me where it's gone. Nobody else has any idea where it might be. And so this really important little microscope is just vanished. Wait a minute. So the microscope body itself, I mean, you, you talked about the slide, you know, but the microscope body, how big is that? Or is the whole contraption tiny itself? Well, it, it's basically speaking, a little square of metal, just, you know, half an inch along the side or a little, little more, a rectangular piece of metal, two pieces riveted together with a lens in between them. And then in front of it, there's a couple of little screws with which Leeuwenhoek could mount his specimens on a pin and focus the specimens by focusing on one of the screws. It fits into the palm of your hand. You drop it in your pocket, you wouldn't know you had it there. Mm. I thought that was the end of it until 2015, when mm. I had a phone call from Christie's. And they said, I wonder whether you'd like to come in and have a look. There is a Leeuwenhoek microscope, we think, and we wonder whether you could mm. give us your opinion. So I hopped mm. on the train and I went to London and I went to see Mr. James Hislop, who's the head of science and natural history. And into my hand, he placed a Leeuwenhoek microscope. And I had a quick look at it with my little pocket magnifying glass and I could ascertain that, yes, this is, has all the hallmarks of being made by Leeuwenhoek. So I said, where did it come from? And he told me the story. He said, well, it's the property of a silver dealer in London who has cancer and wants to pay for exotic treatment for his cancer. And he wants to sell the microscope if it's genuine. And I said, well, I, I think it's genuine. So where's it been all this time? And he told me, this is hard to believe. He told me that it had always, he was a silver dealer. And so he had some little oddments of silver that the kids used to play with, with their doll's house. But in amongst all this silver junk in this little box, a bit like Maitland's microscope, which Philip say bought, inside this box of junk was a Leeuwenhoek microscope. And it had been recognised and taken into Christie's. And I thought to myself, this is going to sell for a huge sum of money. But in fact, it never went to auction. It was bought privately by a Dutch collector called Bert de Genaar. He was a great antique dealer and ancient and antique motor car enthusiast. And he bought it for a few thousand dollars, far less than its auction price. And meanwhile, the mm. chap who'd owned it, the uh, silver merchant, passed away because of his illness. So that little microscope uh, went to the Netherlands and is currently on display in a museum in Leiden. Now, I'd never expected after the saga of the Maitland microscope being sold for half a million bucks, I thought, well, what's the chances of another microscope coming to light? Six months later, in 2015, I had a shock of my life because there on eBay was somebody advertising a bunch of oddments that they dug out of the mud from the bottom of canals in Delft, which is where Leibniz lived. What had happened was that the Delft authorities were dredging the canals, clearing out the canals, and they dumped all the mud in landfill because an awful lot of Holland is reclaimed land. It's such a low country that there's been a lot of land reclamation. So the metal detectorists were going out over this freshly dumped mud to see what they might find. And people were saying to me online, doesn't that look a bit like a Leeuwenhoek microscope? And it was being auctioned. Uh, I think the starting price was $99. So I immediately put in a bid. And nobody responded. And suddenly it said that the auction was terminated. Which struck me as very odd. And later that day, I had an email from a man in Spain called Thomas Camacho, who is an expert on microscopes. And he and his wife have a great collection of antique instruments. Now, he'd been in touch with me some years before about my giving a lecture in Spain. And he came back and said, um, you hear from me again. You might remember last time you were in contact. He said, I am the reason that the eBay auction was halted. So I said, how come? Mm. He said, because I re recognized that that looked like a Leeuwenhoek microscope. 
So I contacted the owner and I offered him a couple of thousand euros for it immediately if he stopped the auction. So he did stop the auction and I am buying it. Well, I was astonished because, of course, you're not supposed to do that on eBay, really, are you? So a few days later, I had a plaintive message from, from Thomas and he said, he won't send me the microscope. Apparently, somebody's told him that amongst this little group of oddments that he was selling, a couple of coins and a couple of little oddments, he said, somebody's told him there might be a valuable microscope, that he won't send it. So I intervened. He asked me, what can I do to help? So I sent a message to the chap. Because of Google Earth, it didn't take me long to run him down through his address. I had photographs of his house from Street View. <laughs> and I contacted him and said, Thomas Camato has bought this microscope. You're going to send it to him. And he said, I can't find it. He said, the house is all being uh, remodeled. So I had to look again at the Google Earth picture. And it was only a week or two old. And I said, no, it isn't. And I sent him a photograph of his house. I said, we know where you are, and you have to send the microscope. And eventually, he agreed to send it. So as soon as Thomas got it, he sent me an email. And he said, thank you so much. At last, I've been sent the Leeuwenhoek microscope. So he said, it's on its way to you. And I, I sent him back an email. I said, don't, don't say that. We'll meet. I'll come to Spain. You come to London. I handed over to two precious. He said, no, I've already put it in the mail. And so the next day, there's the postman outside saying, hello, Guff, can you sign for this, please? And inside this parcel was this exquisite little brass Leeuwenhoek microscope. Now, when Bert had bought his silver one, came to show it to me in Cambridge, and I said to Bert, it's all very well, you know, we say these microscopes are genuine or depending on personal opinion, you know, like art dealers will look and say, ah, yes, this is definitely a genuine Rembrandt, but you'll prove it, haven't you? So I said to him, if you'd let me take it to the Cavendish Laboratory in Cambridge, I can look at it under the scanning electron microscope and see the details of manufacture. But Bert just wanted to own it. He wasn't a scholar. And he said, no, no, I'm not interested in that. I just want to own it. But Thomas, of course, was a doctor and a microscope enthusiast. And he said to me, I'm sending it to you. Keep it as long as you want. I really want you to put it under the scanning microscope at the Cavendish. University of Cambridge, the Cavendish lab. I have access to the scanning microscopes there through Professor Richard Langford, who runs the department. He's got his great assistant, Eric Tapley, who's a wonderful, a wonderful technician. And so I was able to take close-up photographs, immensely close-up photographs, so detailed you wouldn't believe it, of the way in which this little brass microscope that Thomas had slightly underhandedly bought <laughs> And I could publish all the details of how it was made. Weird instrument listed on eBay that turned out to be a piece of science history. This is ITV News at 10 with Mark Austin and Mary Nightingale. And finally, on eBay, it was listed as a weird drawing instrument. But one man just thought he might recognise it, bringing to an end his long quest for the holy grail of microscopes. And he was right. It did indeed belong to the father of microbiology, a 17th century Dutch scientist who discovered blood cells and bacteria. Our science correspondent, Alok Jao, has been taking a look. For more than 300 years, this piece of scientific history lay forgotten, lost at the bottom of a canal. Handmade in the 17th century by a Dutch scientist, Antony von Leeuwenhoek, it's one of the world's first high-powered microscopes. It was found in Delft in December last year and ended up for sale on eBay. Its importance unknown to the seller, who described it as a weird kind of drawing instrument, it was bought by a Spanish collector and is now in the hands of Brian Ford, a biologist who's spent his life searching for original Leeuwenhoek instruments. Historians of science thought, hang on a second, those little three holes in that handle, that's typical of a Leeuwenhoek microscope. And indeed, that's what it turned out to be. It was originally selling for $99 on eBay. It's probably now worth a quarter of a million dollars. Anthony von Leeuwenhoek used this instrument and others like it to lay the groundwork for our modern understanding that every living thing is made from cells. And it's only taken 340 years to get from this instrument, which can magnify by a hundred or so times, to this one behind me, which can magnify by millions of times.
Leeuwenhoek's microscope showed people a world they'd never known. Biologists are still exploring that world today. Alok Jha, ITV News. And I regularly get people saying, mm. oh, look, I've found a genuine microscope. And it's always a, a fake. But within the last year, two real ones have landed on my desk. And I find it extraordinary to think this is utterly amazing. I've actually got knowledge of two Leeuwenhoek microscopes made about 1690. And both have just come to light in the same year. I really can't believe it. Unbelievable. Professor Brian J. Ford, a research biologist, author, lecturer and broadcaster based at Cambridge University. It's been an absolute delight this afternoon. Professor Brian J. Ford, thank you so much for joining us. Nederland's직물 상인이었던 Anton van Leeuwenhoek. would not think this could be a microscope. So you would then hold it towards light. This Dutchman was the first person in history to realize there is an invisible universe which we'd never seen before. Follow him. Anthony van Leeuwenhoek, el considerado padre de la microbiología. El evento que tenía lugar en el Concello contó con la presencia del doctor Brian Ford, experto. And so for the first time we had that information and I thought well how wonderful but what a shame that I've got the detail of the brass microscope but never of a silver one because Leeuwenhoek made them of both metals. And then in December 23 I had a phone call from Christie's and they said Yeah. We've got a Leeuwenhoek microscope. And so I went to have a look, and there it was. It was genuine. It had been found in a house clearance in East Anglia, which is the part of Britain where I live. Not allowed to say any more than that. And the chap took it into Christie's. And they then asked me to have a look at it and work out what was what. Now, they'd already sent it to the Boer Harbour Museum in Leiden, which has got several of Leeuwenhoek's microscopes. And they came back with a very confusing report that was full of errors. And so I said to him, I said to James in uh, Christie's, really, I need a day with this microscope at the Cavendish Laboratory to have a look at it under the scanning microscopes. So James, bless him, he took the day off from Christie's. He came up by train to Cambridge. And uh, with the technical assistance of Eric, I was able to spend the day taking endless still photographs through the scanning microscope, really close up, showing the most incredibly fine detail. And from fitting those pictures together, it must be five feet long, the image I've got. But it shows every tiny detail of the way in which that microscope was made. You might take a slide of a microscope, like, like you said, and put it under a higher power microscope to see the tool marks. That's the wacky thing, you see, Richard, is that for the first time in history, a microscope was put under a microscope. And so, so this, this microscope in the 1600s was put under a, the latest scanning electron microscope. And I could see details that nobody in the world had ever seen before. So yes, I, I can now tell you what a Leeuwenhoek microscope is all about. I mean, it's really quite amazing. I, I mentioned the Boer Harbour Museum. Uh, Thomas actually took his little bass microscope to them and they said, no, it's a replica, it's just a copy. It's not a genuine one at all. It's exactly like one of ours, but it must just be a fake. And it was only the scanning microscope that showed to me, no, it wasn't a fake. The way that the threads were made and the way that the microscope was put together were handmade signs from the 1600s. It wasn't a turned thread like the replicas. It was a handmade thread. It was such an adventure. So, I mean, just imagine, really, go back to when I was in school and there's A.G. Lowndes saying to me, One day you might find Leeuwenhoek microscopes.
there is me having read Dobell's book thinking there aren't any. Everybody knows that. You know, there are 247 he made. They've all been lost. They left. There are a couple of microscopes in museums, but otherwise that's it. There are nine microscopes known. The rest have been lost. And then suddenly Maitland's turns up in the auction. And then within the space of six months, along comes Bert's microscope and Thomas's microscope. And then at the end of 2023, along comes another one, which has just been found in a, in a dusty drawer. I really can't really believe it. It's utterly astonishing. Well, you, you said that um, a lot of the specimens, he would leave it in the microscope. So it was a one-time use, I guess. So of the microscopes that have been found, how many have a specimen in them still versus not? None. Oh. The, spe the specimens were very delicate. And unless you held them with exquisite care, uh, the, mi the specimens would be lost. So no, there weren't any specimens. But of course, I'd already found his sections in the Royal Society. And when I looked through the rest of all the letters, I went through every page of every letter. And he must have sent hundreds, I think 300 or so letters to the Royal Society many of them several pages long. But in the end, I actually found nine specimen packets hidden amongst his letters. So at that time, there were nine known microscopes and nine specimen packets. It was a rather nice balance. Except, I hate to say this, but some of the microscopes that are accepted as being of Leeuwenhoek are, I'm certain, fakes. They've always been regarded as genuine Leibniz microscopes, but now that I had this new method of approach, I've been able to reconsider some of them, and I think I can prove that two or three, possibly four, are actual fake. So, in fact, although some new ones have been discovered, I think some of the old ones are going to have to be discarded. Have you interviewed any of the people that have found these things, and um, has anyone asked what they thought it was? Because that may give a clue as to where they've been lost. If you know, if people mistake commonly for something, maybe that would give you a clue. The Maitland microscope, of course, Phil and they knew perfectly well what that one was. What often happened is that people have seen reports of my work and realised that they had a microscope. In 1981, for example, after I discovered the specimens, there were lots of articles about my work in the Dutch newspapers, including photographs of a Leibniz microscope. And one Dutch resident realized that they had one of these little microscopes in the house. So they dug it out and took it to the Boerhaave Museum in 1982. And the Boerhaave Museum said, yes, this is definitely a Leibniz microscope. Thank you very much. Goodbye. And they didn't intimate to them that it was potentially worth, well, half a million dollars if the Maitland microscope is anything to go by. And so what the Boerhaave did, they locked it away in a cupboard for 20 years and didn't say anything to anyone. And mm -hmm. then they made no actual announcement. They just published the description of this new Leeuwenhoek microscope in a very obscure journal in Dutch, a journal called Gavinia, which stopped publication a few months later. They, they just shut down. So hardly anybody knew about this paper. And I said to some of my Dutch colleagues, if somebody's just brought in a Leeuwenhoek microscope, You'd think that there would be banners and champagne and trumpets and press announcements and television and flashing cameras everywhere. And so my friends said, ah, they said, just look at the law in Holland. And I said, how do you mean? Well, they said, if you own something in bad faith, in other words, if it's stolen property or something, if you own something in bad faith in the Netherlands, then if you hold it for 20 years, then in law, it becomes your property. And so, they said, I wouldn't mind betting that the reason that the Boer Harbour locked it away for 20 years was to make quite sure that at the end of that time, they could say that they were the owners. In fact, some years ago, I wrote to a, a chap called Cockett, who works at the Boer Harbour. He's one of their curators. And I said to him, that microscope from 1982, where did it come from? And he came back and he said, I'll have to check and let you know. And he said afterwards, we don't have any record of actually where it came. Oh, I can't tell you the name of the person who gave it to us. And I said, come on, you're a museum. Everything in museums has all the provenance carefully written down to the tiniest detail. 
So I, I right. got a sneaky feeling that somewhere in the Netherlands is a family who actually owned an extremely valuable microscope, but were never told by the authorities. And the authorities, having held it for 20 years, can now, without question, say it's theirs. Have any of the microscopes been found with the plate that held the specimen? The specimen has been degraded? No, in each case, uh, the, the lenses were held between the two plates and the specimen would be held on a little pin that was mounted on a tiny little stage, a little block of metal, just up against the lens. And the specimen pin is there in every case. But unfortunately, none of the specimen pins have any traces of the original specimens. But that didn't matter. Because after all, at the Royal Society, I'd found nine specimen packets. So we knew exactly how he made his specimens. And they were of the most high quality. But the, there's literally no trace, even under high magnification, of any specimen on them. <laughs> specimen pins under all of them, under the scanning microscope. And no, there, there isn't anything there. But his specimens alone were... were uh, they anticipated modern science. I mean, one of the ways in which we study the structure of things in modern microscopy is to make serial sections. It's a bit like a CT scan. You know, you cut a section and another section and another right the way through from one end of a specimen to the other. And that seems really pretty modern. But Leeuwenhoek did that back in the 1600s. He, he studied cotton seeds and he dissected the seeds open and showed under his microscope that inside each seed was a perfect miniature cotton plant. But then one of the seeds, he cut serial sections. It's only a tiny seed. And he cut it into 32 slices from one end to the other, so that you could see what the structure was inside. That's a very modern thing to do. And he's the one who invented the technique of serial sections. Mm. So next time you go and do the CT scan and you see all these sections of your body, you can think, well, Leibniz was the first person to do that back in the 1600s. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, so what, did Leibniz have any children or wife? Um, like who would have taken his effects once he passed away? Is a himself in a family of five. He had four sisters. He was actually christened Tonis, not Anthony. He was always known as Anthony. And he was born only a few days away from the famous Flemish painter Jan Vermeer. In fact, Vermeer and Leeuwenhoek, their birth entries are on the same page of the baptismal register in, in Delft. Leeuwenhoek married, and uh, he married twice. His first wife died. And he had one child, Maria. They actually, I think, had four babies altogether. The others all died in infancy. I mean, in those days, infant death, neonatal death was so abundant, it was very common, and it didn't cause uh, undue comment in those days. It's an extraordinary, tragic story when you think of it. But his daughter, Maria, who never married, she looked after him for the whole of his life, and really she allowed him to, to do all his work by running the house. In fact, um, after he died, she sent a little box of silver microscopes to the Royal Society as a gift. And they kept mm -hmm. them, they had them for a hundred years. And then in the 1800s, a rather unscrupulous surgeon called Everard Holm asked if he could borrow them because he knew that Leibniz lenses were still the best in the world, even in the 1800s. And so he took them off to his flat in the Chelsea Hospital in London and they were never seen again. In, in fact, there's a, a great scientist, now sadly dead, Derek de Solar Price, whom I knew quite well. Derek was an extraordinary scientist. And he actually, I think, solved the mystery. He said, well, Holm was a plagiarist. He was copying other people's work. And people kept saying to him, you've got all these documents and these microscopes. You really ought to give them back now. And the authorities were getting hot on his tail. So what he did was to set fire to all the documents. And in the process, he set fire to his apartment. And the whole thing burnt down. And Derek said, remember, he said, the microscopes were made of silver. So very likely they melted away and were destroyed when the fire destroyed Everard Holmes' apartment. And that may well be what happened to those. How did people know there was uh, that specific amount, uh, 247, I believe he said? Uh, after he died, a number of the Dutch scholars, uh, there was a big auction of his microscopes. And a number of the Dutch scholars documented in detail uh, an inventory of everything that he actually owned and which was put up for sale. And mm. there were, I think, about 250 mm. lenses that he'd made, which hadn't been yet mounted into little plates.
but a total of 247 completed microscopes. So you can see why Dobell assumed that no more would ever come to light. And the fact that four of them would come to light in my lifetime, and that three of them would be ones I was personally involved with, and that the fourth had come to light only because of newspaper reports about my research, I could never have imagined anything like that would happen. Richard, I mean, the most extraordinary story. It really is the most amazing series of events of my scientific life. Yeah, that's really, really cool. How many actually are around that can be seen that are either, you know, not in private collection in museums or, you know, accessible to the public? There were altogether nine. Then, of course, the tenth one came along. That was the one that was produced after they'd read reports of my research in the Dutch papers, the one that Boerhaver had. And then, of course, you had Bert's little silver microscope that is now in his private collection, which he wasn't interested in having investigated any further by me. Then you've got Thomas's microscope, the little brass one. And that one is now regarded by the Spanish authorities as an item of national importance and is going to have a room of its own in their big science museum up in the north of Spain. So that microscope is going to have a, a very permanent and visible home. And now you've got this one found in East Anglia, which has just been sold and was bought by somebody in California. So I immediately, of course, wrote to my chums in California who are the microscopists, and they all say, well, we don't know who it is. But of course, you know, there's a lot of billionaires up in Silicon Valley who like collecting stuff. And who don't want to admit it because they make themselves a target if they did. So it may be that this last silver one has been lost to scholarship as well. However, that doesn't matter to me because before it was sold, I had a day with it to photograph every aspect of it under the scanning microscope. And I should be publishing those findings over the next few months. Oh, okay. Excellent. So you would be publishing them. That's wonderful. Do you, what effect do you think that'll have once you publish them? You have no idea, or I guess a lot of people will come out of the woodwork and maybe more will appear. Well, that, of course, is perfectly possible. When I was younger, I, and anybody said to me, what about Leibniz microscopes? I would have said, well, they're long since lost. But since, you know, these three have come out in the last few years, who knows? But when you say what will happen, I can also tell you that people will start pinching my research. It happens all the time. Uh, I mean, well, when I discovered the specimens in 81, the Dutch put on a big exhibition about the specimens. No mention of the fact that I discovered them. They, they put it on display as though they'd found it themselves. And um, there are a couple of people now in the Netherlands who've got, I think it was half a million euros. Enormous grant. And their grant is to try and see what you can see through Leeuwenhoek microscopes. I mean, that's all been published over the decades. What if you put out a prize once you do your publication and then you say, um, you know, you'd like to get one more to look under, you know, electron scanning microscope and you, you have a prize amount. If anyone, ha you know, you get a lot of fakes, of course, but maybe more real ones were surfaced that way. Well, that would be good. Uh, but I, I may say that if I had spare money enough to give away as a prize, I would probably be languishing somewhere exotic at the moment rather than talking to you. So, <laughs> no, I mean, you, you could ask. I'm sure there's someone that that can cough up a million bucks if it's found. No, well, well, but I, I, and, uh, it, they would do would, a prize. It would be interesting. Although I think the very fact that these other microscopes are suddenly coming to light because, you know, people see pictures of them in reports on my work and think, oh, I've got one of those. Uh, and the fact that they are worth a lot, although the one that sold in December uh, didn't make half a million bucks. It made up 175,000. I mean, there is an old mathematical question, which is, if one Mona Lisa is worth $50 million, how much are two Mona Lisas worth? And of course, the answer is not 100. It means that if there's two, then the first one isn't as valuable as you thought. And there is a story, I don't know if it's true. There's a tale of, a, of an American stamp collector who went to an auction in New York, I think in the 30s, and he had a unique stamp in his collection. And a second one had been found. And so he went to New York and he bought this second stamp. And in front of everybody, he then took out his cigarette lighter and set fire to it. So it was destroyed. Mm. And everybody said, what are you doing? That's a priceless thing. He said, no, my stamp is priceless. If there are two, it makes mine less valuable. And the fact that the second silver microscope sold for... 175,000 rather than costing nearly half a million does suggest 
that as more microscopes come to light, each successive microscope is less valuable than the one before. He probably wasn't that organized, but were they numbered? Can anyone tell um, which ones are made first and which ones are made later? Like, he probably made refinements to the design, is my guess. What an interesting question. The one I've just been looking at, this, this Anglia microscope, as I call it, has actually got a number four on it. And there's another silver one which has got a three on it, too. Mm. I know the Boerhaave experts looked at it and said, ah, it's been stamped with a figure four. No, under the scanning microscope, you can see it hasn't been stamped. It was scratched with a pointed needle. But we've got two microscopes numbered three and four. So, yes, your question is, is more to the point than you might think. A couple of them have been numbered, and who knows what might come up in the future. Well, what about the other ones that are in museums that you know, are publicly at least somewhat acceptable? What if you, um, if you told you know, whatever museum, hey, I've got one with an etching of four and another of three, would you mind looking and seeing what yours have? Oh, no, we all know what they look like. No, 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 we've got photographs of all of them, and none of the others are numbered. Although, huh. uh, although several of them, the silver ones, are, they are actually stamped as being made of silver, and the date of the stamp is known. So once they've been stamped in that way, then, of course, their authenticity is assured for all time. But I would assume that since silver is such a soft metal and easy to work, I would assume that the silver microscopes were probably made early in his career. And the brass microscopes, because brass is much harder to work, I would think the brass microscopes were probably made later in his career when he got used to working metal. So I wouldn't mind betting that the silver ones preceded the brass ones. Yeah, are there any design changes in the brass ones? Yes, yes. No two are the same. I mean, the one that Camacho has, Thomas Camacho in Spain, it's a rectangle but with a rounded base, whereas this near twin in the Borja Museum is rectangular but with a square base. So you can see the ideas that he had in mind when he was designing them, but the designs are always slightly different. There are no two that are absolutely identical. They, they weren't a sort of um, production line job. Yeah, well, that's interesting. Did he use, um, does it appear that he just used spare bits and parts to make them? Was he like very frugal or was he, um, did he have a recipe to make them, you think? Uh, what... He certainly worked with the metals himself. I mean, you know, um, he had to actually fatten the metal and beat it out himself and then create the rivets. And the way he made the screws was interesting. He didn't cut the screw as you would in the modern world with a die. You know, you just have a tough metal die which you'd put a rod of brass in and twist the die and out the other end would come the brass with a thread on it. No, he rolled the threads and you can see under the scanning microscope the fact that he rolled the threads. Uh, that's a technique you could do at home without a die. People never wondered how on earth did he manage to make screws in the 1600s when screw making machines had not been invented. When he rolled thread. Where you will find rolled threads today is on bicycle spokes. If you have a bicycle wheel and you tighten the spoke up with that little bolt that's up in the rim of the bike, the thread is a rolled thread and not a cut thread. And the way you can tell the difference is with a rolled thread there's no loss of metal. The metal is just moved to one side. So with a rolled thread the diameter of the thread is greater than the diameter of the original rod. Whereas with a cut thread, with a die, you cut metal off. So there, the diameter of the thread is a little bit less than the diameter of the rod. So that's the big difference between a cut thread and a rolled thread. I hope that wasn't too technical, but I know some people would like to know that. Yeah. Now, have you uh, spoken to machinists? or other experts that maybe you could see something that you couldn't? Well, I've spoken to several people who make rolled threads, but of course they all make them with machinery. And I've been trying very hard to find some enthusiast who would show me exactly how you'd make a rolled thread at home. I can work out roughly how you might do it, but uh, somewhere there is a rolled thread enthusiast. If any of you are listening to this excellent series of podcasts, please let Richard know so he can tell me. I'm so keen to talk to a thread specialist who can enlighten me as to exactly how you'd roll a thread. I would love to know the detail. Huh. 
do you have to go into the history of how uh, threads were first invented and made? Is is yeah. there any? There's got to be that. Oh yes, they, they go they go way way back. The Archimedean screw, from thousands of years ago, uh, had a thread. But of course, the early threads were made of wood. And you can make a thread in wood just by sitting down patiently with a hammer and chisel. The question is, how do you make a thread on a little rod of brass that's about as thick as the lead in a pencil? And that's where it gets fun. But of course, they didn't have thread making machines, and yet they still managed to make threads. And by rolling the thread, you can actually create a thread on a rod, which otherwise you would find impossible to cut. It, that in itself has always been a bit of a mystery. But uh, like so many other mysteries in the early days of the microscope, they're questions that nobody else seems ever to have asked. Yeah, yeah. interesting. Well, very cool, Brian. Um, when, when do you anticipate you're going to be publishing uh, information on this and where? There is actually an article at the moment out online. If anybody wants to search for it, it's published online in Laboratory News. And if you did a search online for Laboratory News and Brian J. Ford and Leibnook, then I'm perfectly certain that it would come up. Um, I will certainly let you have the link. And if you can put it on your website, then people can click on that link and see it. So that's the first published article about my work on this microscope. Um, there will be a paper shortly in the journal called Microscopy and Analysis. There'll be one later in a journal published in Chicago called The Microscope, where I write a regular column. Yeah. And it's also going to be in the Royal Microscopical Society's magazine as well, published uh, early in 2024. So, and there will be, oh, at least half a dozen papers after that, giving all the details that we found. Excellent. You know, last question for uh, listeners that are curious about microscopy in general. What are some of the best uh, resources you've ever found where people can see, um, you know, like amazing pictures under microscopes? Well, there are a great number of sites on uh, YouTube. I had to say that um, if you want to see some really good ones, and I, I'm not sure how his site works, but there is a man called Robert Burden, Robert B-E-R-D-A-N in Calgary, in Canada. And Robert has taken some superb videos of microbes down the microscope. And if you can find Robert Burden's work online, he is really terrific. But uh, I had to say that I often lecture on microbes and show videos of microbes under the microscope. And today people said to me, how come the sea is always so clear in the med? Well, this is the reason. It's a little organism, a single-celled creature called Carchesium, which is shaped like a bell, and it has a wonderful round loop of little beating cilia at the front end of the cell. And they pick up... And the videos I put together in my talks are, I don't want to sound boastful, but they're a lot better than the stuff that you find on YouTube. So really we need to put together some proper programmes. You know, I've done a lot of television over the years. My first television programme, in fact, was done, God, this is embarrassing, 61 years ago on BBC television. Um, but um, I, producers always say to me, oh, we love the stuff you do on TV. It was a kind of a, a little frisson of doubt about whether the verdict was right. And I say, well, I want to do programmes about microbes and about the living cell. And they always say the same thing. They say the public don't know about living cells and if we were to fill in our, our, our proposal form and people were to say, you know, what sort of audience reaction are you expecting? The answer would be nil. So I've never managed to have a television producer say to me, let's make a series of programmes. And yet my, my great friend David Attenborough did a programme not long ago where he was comparing uh, natural history programmes in the old days and how they are now. When I first started out, there was so much of the natural world we were unable to film. The cameras, the lighting, the size of the equipment, all meant that the extremely small, the very large, the ultra-fast, or the infinitesimally slow, were beyond our reach. We can now film everything, from the giants of the world's oceans to the smallest invertebrates. Now we can film the tiniest things, like this little leaf hopper. And the leaf hopper he was looking at is composed of about five million cells. But you won't find a decent program about the living cell anywhere on television in any nation in the world. You will find programs about cells that are full of CGI imitations of cells and cartoons of cells and computer models of cells. <laughs>
cells do the work for us. It's the theory of everything. But to see the glorious, voluptuous, moist, sexy, alluring, glitteringness of a real living cell, you never see that on TV. It is the one area of natural history that television never shows anybody. And I think they should. Yeah, I agree. Well, Brian, it's been a really, really great interview. Thank you so much for your past work and your continued work and your, you know, your intense curiosity about all these things. I appreciate you coming on the podcast. Thank you. Well, it was a great pleasure to come.